Hey guys, it's Casey here. Today, I brought to you guys the highly requested Old Pride Punk deck that everyone has been on the rage about. Third place, top cut, Adon Salas. Congratulations again. Thank you. For your regionals. I wanted to bring you guys more of an interview style to this. I wanted you guys to get better information on card choices, what the deck does, why do they play it, all that good stuff. Before I get into that, if you could please check out nextlevelanime.com. That is the sponsor for this video. Great anime apparel at a great price. Thank you guys. Why Gold Pride Punk? What was the reason for this? Why would you pick this over something like Kashtira that was projected to be the best deck? Or even something like Mathbeck with the new Sayak cards that just makes it a one card, Link 3 or even Link 5, depending on the hand. We're, we started analyzing the meta when... Cyberstorm Axis came out. We saw some flaws in Kashtira and Samurai, which we're analyzing what this deck can do when we saw the CCG exclusives such as Rota and their Cherry Carry. Those exclusives actually opened up the deck for the Gold Pride engine because it works so well with the Punk engine. So we actually started developing more and figuring out what we could do. We just thought that it was able to play non-engine that Samurai can't play. It was able to play the proper thing to beat Kashtira. So we figured that we just started kind of developing more and more of what we could do with the deck. How does this work, guys? So what is the synergy between the two engines? What are the like boards you're trying to make? What are the combos? What are you doing with this deck? Oh, so the biggest synergy that comes in the deck, the punk with the gold pride because of life manipulation. Punks let you get access to level threes, which always lets you get access to cherry carry. Always lets you access to the actual gold pride. Gold prides are a lot of layers of interaction on your opponent's turns, such as popping, using your opponent's monsters as equip cards. Resilience that it has in the meta. These two engines flowing together, you can start punk or you can start here and you'll still have an end board with minimum two to three interactions for their turn. Speaking on the resilience, I just want to touch on something. This extra deck is all different colors. That was something that I feared playing Brain of Despia for a while in the meta. You just auto lose to a card like Barrier or that you lose to cards that care about either levels or ranks like Ancient Grave Organism just turns off all synchros. And so the fact that you can go into an OTK with ranks is, is insane. It's really hard to cover like a one card catches all in this type of deck. So when you look at these two engines side by side and you look at them in a vacuum, like if I just play a pure punk deck or a pure gold pride deck, like this deck doesn't do enough, this deck doesn't do enough. This deck enables this deck wholeheartedly. That's why this is the bigger engine of the two. This card also gives you 10 one card starters by itself to get you all the way through the entire package of punk. You didn't need you choose to use a small one on purpose. It was to play as small of an engine here as we could. The reason for two of these, uh, comes from it's it's fine to draw obviously but this card gets really powerful when it comes off a of carry if you draw this and you try to get into carry later in the turn like you have to go into the reborn it's just not as powerful but when you get to search this you're doing way stronger things so like playing three didn't make sense when you just wanted to search it off the carry but really redundant especially when we wanted a lot of the time we wanted a non-engine card or even more punk cards so we can start with so we can flow into everything that we wanted to do so you would say it's more like for the better luck next time you say it's more of like the middle card not an actual starter for yeah exactly deck. that's it's actually a, a perfect way to say it. it's engine requirement almost why is it built this way what, what were some of the choices that you think were notable compared to maybe say like a standard list the standard list i've seen they're playing a lot more heavy gold pride cards, which is understandable because they essentially become extenders with life manipulation of punk. But when we were looking at it, we felt like we had enough with the seven. We needed actually at least seven because of the trap. Because we have a heavier punk engine, we had to make, you know, kind of sacrifices somewhere. And we realized if we get into the punk engine, we're almost always getting into our gold pride engine. Because of the two level threes with the carry, it just makes this engine always accessible. When you're comboing, we're kind of doing pretty standard combo to what you're seeing from other people where we're going to Zayhame and we're getting into the fusion guy we're going into the fusion that tributes a special two for the deck. Ultimately gets us to Punk Dragon and from there we have everything needed to get carry on the field but this card recurring turn over turn gives us the ability to set up lethal and follow-ups whereas this card puts up such a difficult board for the other decks in the meta to interact with that it puts us in really strong positions just lethal and follow up it's really interesting that the dragon drive also just has a weird synergy with the ghost ogre being a level three psychic tuner and at level three just engine just level three is the name of this game three level threes here you have your zayamans 
you have all your other punks, you have the carries, it can either be combo or it can add you more utility cards. So let's talk about the extra deck here because I already mentioned that I like that it's all a bunch of different colors, but what was the thought process going into this extra deck? What were like these little packages I'm seeing? It looks like you have an OTK engine. It looks like you have negates up here in this corner. What, what run me through what we were thinking here. I'll start off with the one that's here in the center. It's the Adam. He found the Dragoobleon, and I think it's because of our friend Rick's cube. It basically, when we get drone locked, when we activate the Ziaman, we wanted something to be able to go into. And if you go Ziaman, grab Foxy Tune, use Foxy Tune's effect to go into the Deer Note, that gives you the rank eight for the Dragoobleon to let you go into the whole Carpenter. Also, it had the added benefit that you were able to get the Numeron Dragon, which is 9,000 damage. This actually came up a lot more than I ever thought it was going to come up. I did OTK a lot of people because of it, but having both those options for one card that is very, very, very relevant in the meta right now felt fantastic. It filled that gap with Droll. And there's so many rank 8 setups in here that like, you can go into Harbinger first. Later in the game, you can go into Draglubia. He doesn't care if it's in the graveyard or extra, so you can bring out either one of these using his material. And we have another 8 up here, so we look so much longevity to capitalize on the 8 after we use the 3Ds to get started. So the other thing with Numeron Dragon, yeah, it comes out at 9,000 on its own. It's a rank one, this is a rank eight, but we can also put either a rank three with it to make it 12,000 or even another rank eight over here to make it 17,000. Like that sounds super excessive, but there's so many matchups where like, it's just a monster is left on the field in attack mode. It's so easy to find lethals just hitting into this and bringing out extra things just to make it bigger. This last effect is kind of relevant. So if he gets destroyed and removed from the field, he will send all monsters on the field to the graveyard and both players can set a spell trap from the graveyard. Especially against super heavy where they don't have spell and trap. It's a great effect, but for us, like we can set the reborn so we get new interaction or we can set a talents and immediately continue playing that way. This can be the only one that attacks his turn. What he thinks is excessive about the 17,000 is actually very relevant when you can only attack with this once. So you want to make sure that you can cover any range of damage you need to do. Like whether they're at only 5,000, 8,000, 10,000, you want to be able to make sure you can always one shot them with that card. A good lead up to that is actually OT King and that's where the Psychic and Punisher and the Amazing Punk Dragon came in. There's just games where Psychic again is just sticking on the board when you're at 2,000 life. It's unbeatable for a lot of decks. And there's also games where he just becomes so big that it's a one punch, one punch knockout. Amazing Dragon being able to spin because we have so many level three psychics able to break boards. That is kind of the trend with this deck also. It has a bunch of different ways to break different types of boards. Did you guys ever see yourself going from like Leon so I know you would always go Leon maybe into Amazing Dragon, but would you ever go Leon into say Psychic again because you just want a monster that they can never get over? It's funny you say that because it actually won me a match because I did that because I think two or 3,000 life and we were down to like, he was only had a couple cards left and Psychic again Punisher, he brought out the Chaos Angel that uh, just came out. He brought that out. So I one up him with the uh, Psychic again Punisher. These are the Negates and the whole Harbinger is also the negate in the deck. Both two of them are rank eights and of course the level eight. It had multiple uses. We needed a second level eight in the deck because of how often we are using the punk engines to go level eight. The baller is a level five, so it does let us to go into the level eight also. This has the added benefit is when we use the full combo, there are waters in our graveyard because of the punk fusion. So this is a spell trap negate. It's a monster negate that lets you play around Nibiru and this is another spell negate. Uh, versus certain matchups such as the Despia matchup. Primary plan is to get into both of these with a couple layers of interaction with my Bright Engine. Yeah, it's also, carry is also a water. Yeah. So if you can get to either your Punk or your Pride Engine, you always have a way to make the Animates of Pater Life. The other part with this, I think the late that we use has to have a Psychic Tuner. So needing a just generic level eight to use Leon with comes up a lot. It also comes up with setup square, like you can use a field spell to special this out, you can use its own effect to special this out, and you get to an eight this way. With Harbinger, the two new decks in the format with Burly and Super Heavy actually make this card a lot more playable. Like the previous format where it's kind of cash dominant, this card like you might get a spell or you might just get thinner. But these other two decks like taking the Wakaoshi or taking Delicious Memory cuts off a lot on its own. Spelling it in this current meta is very impactful. Talk to me about the ratios because I know a lot of these cards you just want to play one, you only need one of it. 
but were you ever concerned about your Castiera matchup specifically being that you only have one Zeus, so whenever you get Unicorn or whenever you get Diabolus, you no longer have carry into a Zeus wipe? Or same thing, if they always just take your Psychic and Punisher, now you've lost the towers, or if they take your Dragoobleon, you guys concerned about that? You didn't think it mattered? I wanna say the short answer to the Castiera decks is good luck trying to figure out which one I'm gonna OTK you with. But the actual real answer is that because we have so many different ways of getting to so many different things, the most obvious pick is always gonna be the Zeus because it is technically the easiest thing to make. But because everything else in the deck basically can more disrupt, it makes it actually really hard for them to figure out which one they actually should be hitting every time. That's mostly why we chose, we felt like this was the most important because there's is random scenarios where you need to start with this card and we'd rather have the second one in case this does not get tagged out at the end phase. Talk to me about like some noticeable cuts, things that you notice that aren't in standard builds. Just a few cards I want to mention, Omega, Barone, the Excel package that gets you into any twos or hires. Why were, did those not make the cut? Um, so we felt like, well, when the Excel and the Baron package could only really be played if you play Gamma. And we didn't feel like it was consistent enough for us to fit those two cards if we open a Gamma. Yeah, of course you can teleport the level two out, but you're kind of taking away what the deck wants to do. So they kind of felt like just a waste of space for those two specific ones. Omega was actually one of the cards we were considering over this level, other level eight. We ended up on this because it is a second level eight that has the spell trap in the game. One thing uh, we did change, this was the gold pride link to. We changed it to Cerberus for uh, Seattle. The main reason we changed it is because link two and Cerberus are filling almost the same role, but Cerberus is generic and you can tactics and go into Cerberus. It just made a little bit more sense just to go to Cerberus because it just covers just a little bit more. The benefit of the, the Link 2 was getting to your Nitro, and granted, I love that part of it, but we felt like there was just, just slightly more scenarios where we need the servers over that other Link 2. A lot of the reasons why we didn't go for the 7 stars like Fenrir or the Thunder uh, is because it stops usually right there. Uh, you start with the 7, then you go with the 3, and then you end on the 10, but what we're really trying to generate is 8s and uh, push our combos and use all the extensions of our Punk Engine. And uh, when 10 sticks there, it gets the negate. Uh, we're usually fulfilling that role with one of these already. So we didn't want to put more cards into our deck when we're trying to fit more non-engine. We can get to the Photon Lord on five summons if we shrink the combo a little, if we think it is like really strong versus our particular hand. But a lot of hands, you can kind of go your normal combo, resolve uh, the card to summon two, and there's just not a good spot for them to be in to like the eight summon when you bring this guy out. One of the reasons why we chose Psychic Tracker is because if we do for some reason feel like they have the Nibiru, this allowed us to have a one card out without having to go straight into the fusion and being able to do some a little bit of different things in order for us not to be so vulnerable to Nibiru. So I was going through the comments and I noticed that people had some questions about some of the choices in your deck. One of them being the Tenki type card of the deck and why you didn't play three of them. We also talked about the Nitro Link in Portland when you topped with it, you were playing it, and we've already kind of maybe discussed about why Cerberus was better. Do you think in the future there would be potential to put back the Nitro Link in your extra deck? I think there is an argument for it, especially if Cashier doesn't get hit. It is one of those cards where it just loops you the Nitro Head, which gives them a token, which is very hard for them to play with. There's also, I feel like, I think I, you, we can all agree on this. There is still a lot of explorations that we can do in the extra deck and the main deck that might shift the extra deck significantly if we find something. Um, I feel like the deck is really wide open. One of the last questions is, what do you do against like floodgate cards, right? Things cards that just say you can't do a certain thing or you can only play a certain amount what, what, what approach do we go for this that's kind of hard to answer because as you see the main deck kind of doesn't have that much for it yeah. you know over a lot of different floodgates and honestly it always depends on which floodgates you're going against it's non-engine so it's kind of hard to say you know what we're going to be going against but we do have some side deck cards we always do respect those kind of decks so we at least have something for it i think if that's your question and you're thinking about some of the other combo decks you have to ask that question across the board like yeah. super heavy has an even more difficult time and they have a limited card pool of what they can even side into Ashtira 
floodgates aren't maybe the answer, maybe they are. Share is a pretty easy time with floodgates, I would say. Um, they're pretty wide range of non-engine, but they also have fenders that can take things with cards. So unless that floodgate specifically stops your fenders from revolving, they have the engine ways uh, to touch them. So uh, just like the most combo deck in history, we're relying on non-engine for the most part. Right, it definitely also just depends on obviously dice rolls and it just depends on what type of floodgate like you said if you're ever summoning dragite not only can you stop floodgates but also with the nibiru's on the side you also could just bounce floodgates and also another card like amazing dragon bounce floodgates banish. you have psychic end you can not only can you banish cards on their board but if you have that card you don't care what floodgate you're under they have to deal with you mm -hmm. that's like a huge problem harbinger same thing Zeus can just wipe the entire board, so it doesn't look like you have the biggest difficulty as long as you can get anything in your extra deck on, on the board. With, for like specific monsters, like especially the towers monsters that are running around, I feel like we did actually have ways to play around the towers monsters, especially because Psychic and Punisher just kind of, when it does come out and we're done with our combo because they can't interact with our combo, it's just normally bigger, stronger, it hits way harder than the other ones. One thing I wanted to touch on is you have a very diverse pool of how you can remove cards. You can bounce them, you can banish them, you can pop them, you can equip them, you can just send the whole entire board if you make Zeus. So it doesn't feel like breaking boards is any big problem and you could also just not even deal with the board if you can just OTK through one monster if you got through any interaction. So the only time I, I ever think there is a problem is the floodgates, but I don't think any one deck like doesn't have that issue as well. So I, I wouldn't be too worried about necessarily moving forward if you are someone that is interested in this type of deck. Moving forward with this deck, Adon, I know you already have a top with this, so I'm, I'm sure you want to keep working on this deck. What are some changes that you would want to make to this or that you're thinking about maybe making to this? As of right now, it might be the non-engine ratios or possibly different cards. It could be another extender, something that I'm going to be talking to Adam and Michael a lot more about. Other than that, the extra deck, I think, we might explore a little bit more for certain scenarios, you know, specifically Droll. I don't see anything else that's better than the Dragoogly Online. But as of right now, I don't see very much. I'm changing this second. Do you notice there was maybe a portion of your non-engine that was better, whether it was the board breakers or the hand traps? Were they both good, both bad? I know I played against three super heavy samurai and I think you played against three, and you played against one or two. And for the most part, I think we all kind of had the same story. It felt like we have an advantage because of the non-engines, because of the drolls, the dark rulers, and the ogres, and the tactics. I think there, there's some non-combos in here with our non-engine. Like, if you were using like a floodgate hand trap like this, and you're drolling, and then you're going to the next turn, like, dark ruler's not gonna hit a lot. Maybe they didn't even get the set up monster effects to activate your talents. Like, there are some anti synergies in this kind of lineup. It's hard to say that like, talents is so powerful, and how drill is so powerful. Like, you just accept those anti synergies, or you try to find something cleaner. I will say though, this deck is a lot of fun to play once you learn how to play it. But I don't want people to get discouraged because. It is a lot to do with the deck, and there's a possibility you might get into time because you're still learning how to play it. It is a lot of fun to still play, but once you actually learn how to play it, the combos are pretty fast, and you doesn't really come up once you understand how to do everything. So, and it was, I felt like I had a lot of fun actually piloting the deck this weekend. I don't know about you guys. Yeah. Any final thoughts? Oh, you got third, man, but better luck next time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tough, tough. Well, thank you guys for watching. For all my viewers at home, let me know if you're more team board break or team hand traps. I personally value hand traps more. I was playing Castira and I absolutely loved seeing either Shifter or Droll in my hand. I just felt like it was a turn skip. You're obviously not gonna be able to play Shifter in this type of deck, but let me know if you like Dark Rulers, Evenlies, any of those cards instead. Thank you guys, have a good day.